Dear all, welcome to the Animate Library Talks. This month, uh, we have distinguished guests from the Archives Portal Europe, which is the largest online archival repository in the world. Archives Portal Europe's manager, Kirsten Arnold, and research manager, Marta Musso, will present us this portal and its network. They will show us how you can contribute to the central repository, and they will also display us the functionalities that facilitates research in such a vast virtual space. Uh, at this point, I would like to introduce you our speakers. Kirsten Arnold has worked with archives for over 15 years. She holds a master's degree, each in communication science and in library and information management. She has expertise in various areas from academic editions via records management, and digital transfer to aggregation of cultural heritage metadata in different contexts. She has been part of the establishment of Archives Portal Europe and currently holds the C COO role uh, of the Archives Portal Europe Foundation Manager. She is also a member of the Technical Subcommittee on Encoded Archival Standards. Our second guest, Marta Musso, is a historian with a specialization in energy history. She is the PR and research manager for Archives Portal Europe. She has a PhD in economic history from the University of Cambridge, and she collaborates to different research and public history projects, promoting new methodologies for archival research in a digital environment. And the moderator of this talk is Mustafa Ergü, after completing his bachelor's degree in sociology and art history department of Istanbul University, he completed his master's degree on early Republican period Turkish painting in the art history department of the same university. Ergül, who has been working in the field of libraries and archives for more than 10 years, works as an archive specialist at the Koch University Sunakaraj Library within the scope of institutional and special collections. Thank you all very much for being here. And last but not least, dear listeners, uh, this message is for you. This talk is currently being recorded. Your microphones and videos are automatically closed. You may type your questions in the chat section and at the end of the talk, there will be a Q&A session where your questions will be asked to the speakers. Now I will pass the word to Mustafa Erg. Well, thank you, Daphne, for the introduction. And thank you for our guest speakers from uh, APE who accepted our this uh, talk event. And also I would like to, again, thank the audiences who are with us today. So I believe today's presentations will give you some insights and also focus on the issues such as how the researchers can benefit from the portal and the, how the institutions can uh, contribute to the portal as well. But before leaving the, the floor to our first speaker, I want to give a brief information about our involvement uh, as a as Sunakash Library to APE. So Sunakaraj Library contributes to the uh, portal with its military history collection project, which is supported by APE grant. So divided in two sections, as Muzaffar argued our collection and also uh, Kranar collection. <clears throat> These uh, collections under military history collection include nearly 4,000 archival materials. Uh, including uh, such as uh, materials like reports, letters, uh, photographs, and maps related to mainly to the Balkan Wars and the War of Independence, uh, especially on the Battle of Sakarya, uh, by covering the time period of ranging between the last period of Ottoman Empire and the early Turkish Republic, like until 1940s. So in this sense, the collection I believe and I uh, think so that will provide useful and new information for the academics and the researchers who are inter interested in military history. Uh, and also if I give some brief information about the project, the project processes are started on the 1st of May 2000, 
2021, including the digitization of the archival materials, uh, also creating and describing the metadata fields and also the translation of the metadata uh, information. Uh, and the project is completed in three months uh, on 29th of July, uh, 2021. So in this manner, I, I can say that this project can be considered as as an important example of how libraries can pursue or continue their works in the pandemic as well. So at the moment, the collection is accessible both through APE, for APE and also the library's uh, digital collections, which will uh, I will type the links in the chat box in two minutes. So, and the one last thing that uh, by contributing to the Portal uh, Sunakaraj Library became the country manager of Turkey. So the, we have some additional responsibilities on that as well. So before giving the floor to our first uh, speaker to Kirsten, I want to remind the audiences that you may ask your questions through the chat box so that I can direct them uh, at the end of each session. Maybe if it's too relevant or uh, too urgent, I will just direct them uh, at the end of the speakers' uh, sessions. So again, thank you, uh, Kirsten, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mustafa and Defne, for the introductions and for the invitation and the chance to present Archive Sport Europe in this context. Um, I'm gonna share my screen and I'm gonna start with a little bit of background information on Archive Sport Europe and how it all began. Um, it all began in the early 2000s, and I have included a quote from a report that was probably the most essential in setting up Archives Portal Europe, the report on the archives in the enlarged European Union in February 2005. And there are two essential tasks that were mentioned and identified for the archival domain in this report, which is um, establishing online access to archives and doing that via an internet gateway or portal to documents and archives in Europe and cooperating with European networks in the field. We were lucky enough to get two rounds of funding from the European Commission. Um, that is what constituted in the APNET and the APEX project. And you can see that while at the start uh, in APNET, which ran between 2009 and 2012, we concentrated more kind of on the Western part of Europe. Um, we extended that to in a total of 32 countries in the APEX project. So the APEX project was all about extending the countries that participated to Archives Portal Europe, but also starting to include other archival institutions than the national archives that were initially included in the APNET project. Since 2015, since the end of APEX, um, the work around Archives Portal Europe has been taken over by the Archives Portal Europe Foundation, which is established in the Netherlands with a head office there in The Hague. Although um, we are truly kind of digital, because this is only kind of a physical address that we have while we are working um, remotely in different countries. Where are we at at the moment? We have representations of 36 countries in the portal, uh, which means we've got content and information in more than 24 languages in five alphabets. We have information about uh, 7,100 institutions. 1,100 of those are actively contributing with content. And that means that we are currently aggregating more than 600,000 collections of archival material all around the continent um, and also a little bit over the continent. Uh, we have different types of institutions that are all mentioned, um, national archives, but also regional and city archives, as well as church archives, university archives, business archives, um, and archival collections of let's say, non-archival institutions. Um, so we are more looking into the question of how the material is managed than specifying a specific type of institution that can contribute to Archives Port Europe. 
The work is structured around four main areas. Uh, so we've got kind of the administrative and organizational part, which is the assembly of associates representing mainly national archives who also give us some money to actually do the work that we are doing and the governing board, which is the managing board to do the day-to-day -day work and set out the strategy uh, for the next few years. We've got the foundation staff uh, represented by Marta and myself. And then we've got the actually essential part, uh, which is the network of country managers. And you will see why this is essential in the next two slides. Um, as I mentioned, the APEF team is distributed across the continent, and we are actually only three people at the moment in the central office, so to say. Uh, so we've got Marta, uh, myself, and then we've got one developer who is placed in Athens. And we couldn't do what we are doing without the country managers. Um, so Mustafa already mentioned that essentially the colleagues at Koch University have become country managers for Turkey by being the first institution from Turkey that is contributing to Arca Sport Europe. And the country managers are our in-between between the central team and all the institutions participating to Arca Sport Europe in the various countries that are connected to the portal because they know their communities best, they know the systems best, um, and that would be something that we couldn't manage uh, with just a very small team um, from the central point of view. So the country managers network is meant to collaborate within the network itself. So all the country managers also support each other and exchange ideas, but then also mainly to connect Arcos Portal Europe to the different content providers in their respective countries. So what does the portal include specifically and what does it present? Um, and I want to start with the um, more technical side of things. So the portal has different components. Uh, so there is the website that you see when you go to arcosportaleurope.net uh, and where you can access the content that I mentioned. But we also have a back end, the so-called dashboard, which is how, where the institutions who provide information actually can manage the data that they share with us um, and can set all different steps of data processing that are required in order to get the data into Arcos Portal Europe in their own time and in their own account. Um, we also have a local tool, the data preparation tool that can be used um, and basically gives the same functionality as the dashboard does on a central point of view. And with regard to kind of the back end side of things, uh, the front end side of things, sorry, uh, we also have an API, uh, which is currently not used that much, but we are looking into extending that. Um, and we have a network of registered users with some additional functionality available in the portal, which Marta will give some more details on later on. All of our developments are open source, so you can find all the code for front end and back end and the local tools in GitHub. Um, and anyone who is interested could essentially kind of take what we have done and implement that in their own context. Um, and of course, uh, that also kind of allows contributions if anyone is doing development that could potentially be useful in the broader context. In terms of the information that Arcos Portal Europe presents, um, so we are essentially starting out with information about the institutions themselves, giving a little bit of contact information, but also the possibility to tell users a little bit about your institution. Uh, so um, tell them about the history of the institution, tell them about the holdings of the institutions before actually going into the question of providing content. The content also is kind of following in three different steps. Um, so we have two possibilities to describe collections on a relatively general level, the so-called holdings guides and source guides. Um, holdings guides describe collections from one institution, 
while source guides could describe connections from several institutions connected via a specific theme or topic. And then we've got the collections themselves. Um, and there again, we have different levels of detail in terms of the description. Um, so it could be just collection level information that is included, but it can also be down to item level information um, that is available. And this item level information can then link to digital objects when they exist. So there's no requirement in the context of Archives Port in Europe to provide links to digital objects or to provide digital objects at all. Um, but you can also kind of just give us the metadata because we are of the opinion that just knowing where something is or it's already useful to the users. And in addition to that, we also have descriptions of records creators, which usually go along with the collections. Um, there is not that much in this area at the moment, but that's again an area where we look into expanding. In terms of what is covered, um, so I already mentioned we've got 36 in uh, countries um, participating in Archives Portal Europe at the moment, which is about 75% more or less of what you usually get when trying to establish the number of countries in Europe. Um, in terms of types of institutions, I think we are relatively well covered with regard to the more administrative side of things with regard to national, regional and local levels. Uh, we certainly can improve on representation of other types of institutions with regard to specifically business archives or also community archives and, and other, um, let's say, um, specific institutions that are not necessarily that often involved in, in contexts like, like ours. In terms of the content, um, so we've got 100%, so to say, coverage with regard to metadata when it comes to the content that we hold. Um, and at the moment, we've got mainly digitized links um, to material, so material that exists analog and has been digitized. Um, we do not necessarily have anything that is digital born yet, uh, but that is of course something that is certainly coming up in the future. And this is again kind of a representation with regard to the level of description and the level of detail that increases step by step. But uh, as mentioned, there's no requirement in terms of when these different levels have to be reached uh, or how fast they have been reached once you are contributing to the portal. So how does contribution actually look like uh, if you are an institution with archival collections? Um, we have essentially kind of three different ways how uh, we are currently working with our contributors. So we've got some countries where we have national aggregators established. Um, so these are essentially kind of doing a very similar job to what Arcos Portal Europe is doing, but on a national level. Um, there might also be regional aggregators or thematic aggregators uh, to a certain extent. Uh, next to them, we've got national archives administrations. So this is where essentially kind of the administration of the country is set up in a way that means that the National Archives is in the same way responsible for regional and local branches of archival institutions. Um, and they are, for example, all using the same system. So they are not necessarily an aggregator that has been set up separately from how archival management is organized, but are kind of coming out of this organization. And then we also have the possibility um, for institutions to contribute directly to Archives Port in Europe. And this is also reflected in the way how data is managed in our back end in the dashboard. Um, so we distinguish between country managers and institution managers. And depending on how the data flow looks like for each country, um, the country manager will either manage the different institutions directly, or they will assign an institution manager that either manages just one institution or several institutions. So the use case for an institution manager set, managing several institutions 
could be a regional aggregator, for example. There's a little bit of administration that needs to be in place when becoming a content provider to Arcasport Europe. The metadata exchange agreement sets out the collaboration between Arcasport Europe and the institution that wants to become a content provider. Um, it's mainly kind of looking at the functionalities that we are providing from our side uh, and how they can be used by the content providers. Uh, but it also sets a base license for all the metadata that is shared with Arcasport Europe. So we distinguish between the, the metadata and any content, any digital objects that might be linked from the metadata. Uh, those objects will always remain at the sides of the content provider, so we are not taking them in. We'll be only linking to them, um, and Amata will show that how that looks like in the portal later on. So this is essentially the main precondition for getting an institution manager account in the live system. Um, just to kind of illustrate a little bit how, how the context in which we are operating uh, looks like and, and what challenges that might bring with. Um, so as I mentioned, we've got more than 30 countries contributing. And of course, most of these countries have um, an administrative system that is very specific to them um, and that also has influenced how archival organization is done. Um, and most of them also use different technical systems. So we've only got, I think, one software that is used in several countries um, and all other countries are either using their own commercial systems or also kind of adding own developments into the mix, uh, which is a challenge because that means that we need to kind of adapt to different ways to do things um, with each new country and each new content provider that wants to join. Then, as I mentioned, we have different types of institutions contributing and that means different describing traditions, but also different capacities. So the question of how much support we give from the central team uh, will also differ from one institution to another. So there might be uh, bigger institutions with their own IT teams um, that can do most of the preparatory steps themselves. And there might be other institutions where we may, might just have one person working uh, in all different kinds of capacities um, where we need to kind of do uh, more support and give more support in order to get them ready for contribution. And then, of course, there's the question of multilinguality, and uh, Marta will go into that in more detail. But just to mention, so we've got a multilingual interface, um, there's possibility for multilingual search, and the content itself, so the metadata that is provided to Arcus Portal Europe, will always remain in the language that it is provided to us in. So um, while the interface might give you some orientation as a user, um, you will have to be able to actually read the, the, the content and understand the content if you want to do research. What is in it uh, when contributing to Arcos Portal Europe, apart from being part of this wider network, apart from having the possibility to engage with colleagues uh, from all across the continent, um, Arcos Portal Europe can also be a gateway into other aggregation services and initiatives. Uh, for example, Europeana as the cross-domain cultural heritage portal in Europe uh, or Daria, uh, which is going more towards the research side of things, but also things like the International Center for Archival Research or International Council on Archives, uh, who is one of our supporters. A word on standardization and interoperability, um, because that's essentially the core of all the work that we are doing. So with all these different approaches that we have uh, with regard to different countries, different languages, different systems, different types of institutions, there of course is a certain need to standardize things in order to make sense of all of this um, in the best way possible to users um, who might not necessarily be acquainted with all the different differences that are going on. Um, and 
bringing this together is kind of working towards a central system. And you will see that there are a few elements in there that are already mentioned earlier. So we start on the left side with national portals or an institutional system, depending on whether there's an aggregator working with us or institutions working directly. Um, we've got supporting software and technical documentation to help in setting things up. And then we have different tools available for our content providers to prepare the data either locally with the data preparation tool or centrally directly in the dashboard. Um, there also is kind of a, a duplicate system available, the content checker, which is the test system for our content providers. Um, this is completely independent from the live system and specifically at the start gives you a possibility to just kind of get acquainted with the different processes, but also a possibility to see how your data will look like once imported into Arcos Portal Europe and how you will be able to search in it. In terms of standardization, we are basing our work on international archival standards. So there are the description standards from ICA. Um, and if you're working in an archival institution or with archival material, you probably have heard at least uh, of ISAG, the International Standard Archival Description. Um, and there are also other standards when it comes to persons and families, to functions or to organizations. And on the right hand side, we have the equivalent in terms of an encoded standard, which essentially are XML schemas. Uh, and that is what we are using in Archives Portal Europe, uh, because we need something that is not only understandable to a human eye, but also understandable to a machine. And what we have done specifically with regard to EED, the encoded archival description, and ECCPF, the encoded archival context for corporate bodies, persons, and families, is that we have created subsets of these international standards. They are tailored towards the use in Arcos Port Europe. Um, so we do not use all the possibilities that these standards in general um, provide. And we have to find some specificities with regard to certain pieces of information being required, like the identifiers, for example, um, and certain typologies that we have defined in order to then be able to pick up on that for functionalities that we want to support in the, the front end. And these profiles, these application profiles are also based on the use of those standards in our partner institutions, which means that with every new partner that comes in, we might also have another look at these application profiles in order to see that they still best support all the different possibilities that the data brings with. Essentially, these standards and profiles are different ways to say the same thing. So what we need to do is kind of set up a vocabulary, a mapping between the different formats and standards that content providers bring to us um, and the, the central format that we have defined in the context of Archives Portal Europe. And this means that we are transforming elements and fields from the local formats into what we have defined as being used centrally. Um, and we might also do a little bit of normalization. Um, so this is, again, kind of looking at the topology that I mentioned earlier um, in order to make use of specific pieces of information for functionalities in the front end. So during this transformation process, this technical conversion, um, the two main things that are happening is streamlining. So adding predefined types to distinguish, for example, a digitized text document from a digitized image uh, or predefined types for search functionalities. For example, identifying the main reference code, the main identifier of an item from previously used identifiers that might still be part of the metadata for reference. And the second thing is normalization. So for example, we have an automatic process in there that allows us to normalize dates so that we can 
offer a date-based search. Um, we have a possibility to assign subject headings for a topic-based approach. Um, and we have a possibility to add standardized rights information to make it easier for end users to understand what they can or cannot do with a specific piece of information or a specific object. And part of this happens automatically. Uh, so it's purely technical and in the transformation style sheet. And part of these things can be influenced by the content providers directly via a simple form where they select predefined values from a drop down and might be able to add a little bit more information like you see here on the screenshot for the rights statements. One word on the subject headings, so subject terms in archival metadata, uh, and this is something that Marta will show you in a minute. Um, so this is essentially picking up on controlled access terms, and ideally these would be assigned when creating the descriptive metadata. What we have found in reality, however, working with this for more than 10 years now is that they a, are not always part of the archival description tradition. Um, they might not necessarily be taken from controlled vocabulary, so they might just be assigned by the person creating the description um, on their own account. Um, and sometimes they might only be available on collection level, but not necessarily with each and every item, uh, which of course would be ideal in order to support recovery. So what we have set up in the portal at the moment in the dashboard is a possibility for our content providers to essentially take the subject headings that are in the material already, and that can be in any of their languages, and that can be on the collection level and or on the item level, and create a mapping to a list of topics that we have defined for central use. Um, the central list is also available in different languages, so depending on the language that you're using for the user interface of the portal, you will see these topics appearing. Um, and in the back end, they are mapped to documents in all different kinds of languages. And with this, I'm stopping my presentation. Um, there might be a short moment to take initial questions if there are any, and otherwise I will hand over to Marta to present how all of this looks like in the portal. Well, thank you, Kirsten. Uh, like is a huge project which offers uh, a lot and also provide wide, wide range of uh, sources but uh, as you, as you uh, mentioned through your uh, presentations there are a lot going on at the background of this project such as integration of different systems and also standardization of you know different institution practices so i have just one question just in a general way uh, Actually, is there a kind of a criteria for the APE for accepting uh, collections? Uh, should the collection should be should have been developed in Europe geographically, or do you accept you know other collections which are actually located outside of the Europe but relatively related with the uh, Europe and the European you know historical culture? Yeah, um, so we we are collecting or aggregating um, collections from and about Europe. So uh, it isn't necessarily a requirement for an institution to be uh, located and operating from Europe, uh, but we are also accepting collections that are uh, related to European history, but uh, managed by an institution that is somewhere else around the globe. Thank you, and also, uh, can you elaborate on how do you integrate these different uh, systems of the each institution? Is, I mean, for example, we experienced that uh, challenge uh, in our project that we are using OCLC's content DM, and uh, it seems that we are the only institution who uses that uh, uh, software management system. So, uh, do you do you kind of face different, you know, uh, technical issues to you know integrate? these you know systems in just in one uh, portal 
Um, yeah, so, so there, there are different kind of steps to, to this question, probably in terms of, of an answer. So um, a lot of archival management systems nowadays um, provide export formats um, to, to share your data or even just kind of to, to upgrade to a new version and there, therefore you want, might need to export the data from the old system and put it into a, a new system. And ideally, these exports would already be in EED, so in the encoded archival description. Um, if they are not, they mostly are in, in XML format, so some kind of XML format that might be another XML standard, like, for example, Dublin Core, which is relatively straightforward, only has a few kind of fields and, and is kind of seen as, as a common denominator um, in, in cultural heritage to a certain extent. Um, or it might be some proprietary XML format that, that is specific to, to that um, software and, and to the institution uh, to a certain extent, because some software also allows for customization. And that, of course, then adds another layer of complexity, so to say, to, to that. Um, I think as long as it is something that we can process with a machine and can kind of try to understand uh, with a machine, um, there will always be a possibility to, to map that to the central formats that we have defined for ourselves. Um, depending on how different the formats are, it might require some more kind of um, back and forth between the, the, the new content provider and our central team to, to really understand and, and make sure that, that the mapping is correct. Um, the closer both formats are, the, the easier it gets, of course. Thank you. Actually, I, I have I have some questions as well, but I will wait uh, to Martha to present. So I will uh, eventually direct you those questions at the end of Martha's presentation. So if you have nothing that we can move on to Martha Musso for her presentation. Hello. Uh, thank you, Mustafa. Thank you, Kirsten. I hope you can hear me well and that you can also see the screen being shared, the full screen, hopefully. Um, so just to show how the portal then looks um, to the front end users, to, 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 to any person that comes to the to the website archivesportaleuropeunet and sees um, you know starts their their research. Uh, so the first the first thing I would like to say just as a bit of an introduction is that it really brings about a new way of thinking archives and rethinking historical research um, because we are using our historical tradition to very much being based on our community or on an institution or on um, a specific collection that we seek and then we study and then we write, uh, um, we write research or we conduct our research for whatever purpose. Whereas um, with Archives Portal Europe, it's extremely transnational. Um, so it's ideal to start with, uh, with an idea about something that we would like to research and then see uh, if documents exist and where they, uh, they exist. So it's a type of portal that will uh, uh, that is meant to bring about more transnational aspects of European history and not just working with um, those archives that everyone will imagine they exist, like the national archives, but really, you know, local, small institution, parish institutions, et cetera, et cetera, where you can find out they exist uh, on the portal. Um, so one aspect of transnational European history that can be uh, studied, for example, is comparing isolated European communities their parallel lives um, over, over the centuries and et cetera, et cetera. And then it's also interesting to see how historical events or characters are narrated in different archives with different types of, uh, um, of documents produced in different countries on a same, uh, um, on a same uh, uh, episode or in also different types uh, uh, of institutions. So for example, the, the difference again between state archives and community and community archives. So it promotes a bottom-up approach to historical research um, in different in different way and on a and on a scale that was previously um, previously impossible. 
Um, it also promotes quantitative research. So see how many documents on a specific event or on a specific character in which archives, how, mu how much it exists uh, on something it visits in itself, uh, something quite interesting to historical research. Um, and of course, um, it gives a possibility not to write, to, not to do research on one institution, um, and then another one, and then another one, but to search into multiple institutions very far away geographically uh, at the same at the same time. Uh, so this is how the homepage looks like, and looks like. And in a second, I will I will take you there. Um, but if we have there are basically three ways um, to conduct historical research through directory, um, for keyword search, for topics. Um, and then we will also see when you land, when you land on our portal, um, these gallery of documents, these are sort of like small exhibitions that we organize uh, month by month. If you go on the portal now, you will see they're quite outdated. The reason is that we are conducting a very big redesign of the portal to uh, which I will uh, uh, speak about in a, in a few minutes. Um, so we had to abandon this interface to focus on the new one, which will be hopefully live um, in just a few weeks, uh, few weeks from now. Um, so we can start with the directory uh, here in um, but at least all of the archives that are contributing um, to Archives Portal Europe. <clears throat> so you can see it's quite a worldwide, uh, <laughs> concentrating on Europe, but it's quite a worldwide um, contribution. And here you have the list of all um, of all institutions contributing, and at the very very least, you will find is in, we will find instructions on um, how to access the archive, the website, informations on uh, opening times, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then ideally, you will also have and let's see, Turkey is like one of our newest <laughs> contributor. Uh, we will also have a list of archival material from that institution um, that is available um, that is available on Archives Portal Europe. So, for example, Turkey recently contributed uh, with a uh, Koç University Milan. Uh, um, military history, history collection. And you can see here, so from the institution, go to the, um, go to the list of, uh, go to the list of documents available. Um, but this, as I said, it's the slightly more traditional way of approaching uh, archival research. So starting with, with a specific institution and then see what's in that institution or starting with a specific collection and access the material from that collection. The added value of Archives Portal Europe obviously is that it can span, it allows to span um, and do research into, into multiple um, into multiple institutions at the same time. So search um, is meant to represent keyword search, which really is like a new way uh, of doing archival research in a, um, in a digital environment that's for, for everything. Um, here you can filter down if you're only interested in selected countries or selected institution in, uh, um, in that country. Um, And then you can also choose um, where to look for the keywords. So if in the title, the content summary, the reference code with no selection, it will search everywhere. Um, type of documents, if you are interested specifically in holding guides, uh, source guides, or the archival description, the finding aids, and then the dates of creation. However, dates of creation is one of those metadata that uh, Kirsten mentioned that are not always um, provided by the institutions in a format that is machine readable. And that is obviously not the fault of the institution, but it's just um, the massive amount of work that sometimes is required um, to switch to, to digital catalog. So it is a constant work, uh, a constant work in progress. Um, so search keyword works like Google or any other, uh, you know, engine, <laughs> online uh, engine. So if I look for, we always use Napoleon because it's um, quite an important character in European history, so you're always bound to find a lot of material. Um, but you can search on anything, um, whether it's names or, or an entity, something more abstract like economics, um, or really anything anything that you're interested in, in searching. Um, 
So here you can see, first of all, that there are three levels of results. We have a search in archives. We search into the archival descriptions of, of each archives. Um, search in names is search into the records, producers, family of people or, 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 or other bodies. Um, so it's, a, it's another type of archival description. And then you can search in institution, which means it searches into the information provided by the institution on the institution itself. So in the case of Napoleon, for example, um, here we really hardly have um, one, um, one result which refers to the description, the description of, the, of the institution. Um, and then you can see that we have a list view, which lists the, um, the documents in order of relevance. And then you can search, we, you can also change the, the way they're organized. And um, but otherwise it's just the, amount, the number of times that specific keyword or set of keywords appear, um, appear in the document. Um, and then you have a context view, uh, which allows on a glance to see where um, where exactly on the nested tree of, of archival collections those, uh, those documents are, are placed. Um, you also then have filters. You can filter by country, you can filter by, filter by archival institution, topic, and I will get to that uh, in a moment. Where the where the keywords was, whether finding it, Olgin guide, source guide, etc. Uh, we have date, and we have object types. Of course, again, uh, these filters have to be taken with a pinch of salt because, unfortunately, not all institutions have all the metadata in uh, in a machine readable format. It's one of the work in progress we are um, we are doing. Um, but otherwise. Um, if you click on the finding aid, so this one, for example, is from um, is from the Netherlands, and you can see you can see um, the description. It it it, it saves it saves uh, in a digital level, but in, in the digital way, it, it saves completely the context of the um, of where the document is. So it's possible to then go from here on, uh, on an S3 to the to the description of the whole uh, um, of the whole collection or the whole file of the whole dossier. Um, if you're interested in only uh, in only accessing material that have a digital object, if you're looking for an image, for example, or a specific document, and you know it's uh, it's online and available online, you can filter like that and. Only in from only the material that has the digital document attached will appear. Um, so again, if you click on the finding aid, you will see again the description. Some description are very accurate, even at an item level. Some are more scarce. That again <laughs> depends on the single institution and what they've been able to do with their collection so far. Then, if you click on the documents, you can access directly the document digitized if it exists and if it is online in the website of the institution. So when I click here or here, I leave Archives Portal Europe to go to the um, website or web presence, whatever that is. Some, some archives have some collections on Flickr, for example, not necessarily on a specific website, but they do make them available, the objects available to users because it's obviously um, very, very useful. Um, so this is for um, this is for the very basic keyword search. Um, but as Kirsten mentioned, we operate in a very strong multilingual system. Um, so what we access here as Napoleon, it's really only uh, in those languages where Napoleon Bonaparte is spelled like this, uh, which is a minority actually. So you can use Boolean operators and wildcards. Um, so for example, actually the best way of searching for Napoleon here is like that, because there are a whole bunch of different accents and different ways of spelling it. And if we add an asterisk, that's another wildcard. It will also allow to search for Napoleonic, Napoleone, for example, that will be the Italian spelling, for example, with a final E. Um, and then, sorry, I pre-read it because I can't. I don't have a Greek 
alphabet here, uh, and we operate with five different alphabets. So sorry, I use the Greek one because my husband is Greek, so I have to do that. Um, so these, for example, will also add alphabets, and then you can add the Cyrillic alphabets and, and the other alphabets we have available. Um, at this point, you only match at least one word because otherwise it will search for um, the, the, it will search for all the words that you put. If you set much, if you put much at least one word, it will operate as sort of like an or boolean uh, or, or boolean operator. Um, and see, as you can see, we have many more many more results compared um, compared to the previous interaction. Um, just so you go back to in search institution. Uh, for example, here we have now four because we have a lot of. Uh, Via Napoleone or Via Napoleona in Italian. Um, so that would be things that don't have anything to do with Napoleon Bonaparte. Um, but it's still a very interesting function because, for example, if you're looking for, um, for, a, for a character, for someone, um, say, for example, to, this morning I was conducting research on Lelio Basso, who was uh, an Italian journalist and politician, and I found out um, just searching for his name here in the repository that there is a, fund, a, a, a an archival foundation dedicated to him, which I didn't know it exists. Um, so it can be very, very useful also in that sense. Um, and then back to searching archives, just to show you uh, very quickly, one other thing you can do is whenever you find something interesting, if you sign in uh, and create your own, um, your own account, you can then bookmark, um, you can then bookmark um, the results that you find interesting and you can share, you can share them, you can create collections uh, from them and you can save them in your, in your account. Um, only however, if you register, um, if you register as uh, as a user, so this is all the these are all the functionalities that the keyword that the keyword um, search allows. But then we also um, we also allow to search in topics because sometimes it's obviously difficult um, to think of an exact set of keywords for um, some of the research. Um, so topics are obviously a very, very useful tool and something we are very strongly investing with um, that are basically ways of aggregating material from in different archives around a specific subject of research. As you can see here from our small cloud, which is um, only a small chunk of the, of the types of, uh, of, the, um, of the topics that we have available, we have very different um, types of topics in terms of uh, in terms of subject, in terms of uh, wideness, in terms of in terms of scope, um, et cetera, et cetera. So we have very wide one like democracy, very small one like the 1848 revolutions, um, and so on and so forth. So if I click on any of these, I will get the results um, from different from different archives um, that are tagged with these closed vocabulary that uh, um, that Kirsten mentioned that was created. Uh, with a combination um, of a UNESCO, the UNESCO thesaurus and the UK archival uh, thesaurus. So if you look to a context view, however, the reality of the, um, the reality of the topic search at the moment, unfortunately, is that most of the material comes from France and to a lesser extent from Germany, because these are the countries where there is a tradition, a strong tradition of um, topic tagging, and they that was represented in APEF. Um, let me see, there is there are others that are slightly more, yeah, there are slightly more representative. So this one has Poland as well, but it's only a handful of countries right now, um, unfortunately, who use topics. So we are trying, however, to push for this um, as a very useful, what we believe is a very useful way for um for users to navigate uh to navigate this immense amount of material um when when they're doing when they're doing their research so sorry i'll go back to my slides which i hope you can see 
And just to give you a sneak preview of what will hopefully be online in a few weeks, so the new portal, as, as we say, um, because it's, it's, it's a completely makeover of, of the graphics, we're trying to make it easier and, and, and nicer to navigate, but it's really not just an aesthetical thing, it also has uh, important additions to, um, to what users, both front-end users and back-end users of the institution um, can do with this. So this is how the home page looks now. It has um, reproduced the same things that I just presented in the old portal, in the current portal, so to speak. And, uh, um, and it has all the functionalities for backend users that, that Kirsten described previously. Um, I will talk about particularly with uh, about topics. Oh, sorry. It renders the the, uh, the highlights in a better in a better way. I was one of the exhibitions in a better way. Um, but if you go so particularly with topics, here you can see a longer list, a full list of uh, of the topics, and each topic will have uh, their own home page where there are um, links to other interesting um, interesting material inside or outside. Um, Archives Portal Europe, and then when clicking on a search within the topic, you will actually see the same results as before. Uh, sorry. Okay, the same results as before, just presented in a better way with the same filters, which will hopefully be more and more um, useful and um, as uh, this archival descriptions, metadata descriptions improve, uh, improve inside Archives Portal Europe. Um, however, it will also have a very big difference, which is when you, when you click on the results to access the find name, um, apart from the description, uh, as you see now in the old portal, you will also um, have this set of buttons, which will allow you, first of all, to write the content, which can be very useful for archives and for us to understand which parts are searched by the users and where we should intervene to make an archival description uh, better and more clear. So sort of like on-demand type of improving, the, of improving the, the descriptions, which makes more sense than just uh, randomly selecting from, you know, million and million of documents, which is the work of a lifetime for several people. Um, it allows to contact the institution in a slightly better way than, uh, than it is designed now. It also like to inquire about digitization. So again, like with archive, like and better in the archival descriptions, there's also a point of uh, um, try and see where materials can be digitized when users uh, when users request them. Many archives, particularly national archives, that have uh, more uh, availability of, of resources, um, do it uh, do it already. So we try to facilitate this also for. Um, for smaller for smaller institutions and see if uh, uh, if they can actually then provide the material to to the researcher and hopefully keep it online in some way for other researchers once the digitization has occurred um, and then in particular we're trying to um, extend significantly the crowdsourcing part uh, of what we do at uh, what we do at Archives Portal Europe um, through make a suggestion. We ask users uh, when they want and when they have time um, to perform some actions such as suggest a translation for the material because obviously as Kirsten said we want to keep all descriptions in the local language, it will simply be undoable um, to translate them and also will lose the context um, of, uh, of, of when the archives were, was created. So it's very important, but obviously having a translation will be very, very useful. Um, at the moment, we, we write in our instructions guide to just copy and paste the text and use Google Translate. Um, we will have this functionality embedded in, in the new portal, so people will just be able to click on, you know, translate. It will be Google Translate. It's an excellent tool, good enough um, for understanding more or less what, what's in that collection that in, in a language that you, that you don't know. But obviously, if this translation can be improved by the users, uh, the better. Um, you can connect it to another resource, a YouTube link, uh, Imagine Europeana, whatever you can think of. 
Um, and finally, what we are hopeful to use um, in selected projects, but we will organize is actually assigned to topics. So whenever a um, user see um, some document that is not been assigned to a topic, but is relevant to the topic, suggest to assign it it will then be up to the institution that owns that document to decide whether it's uh, the appropriate suggestion or not but it's again something extremely um extremely useful um to make you know archives portal europe more shared um and improved uh, an improved uh, uh, tool for research um thanks thanks to the contribution of the user so finally yeah. one of the spirits of this all enterprise is really to create a missing link between um, researchers and archivists worldwide. So to you know, cancel geographical and language barriers and really allow to have a better, um, a better presentation of the part of the institution and a better access on the part of the researchers um, to, the, to the European archival heritage and also improve the um, social machine aspect of Archives Portal Europe. So a place of, of the web and of Archives Portal Europe in particular. So a place where uh, users and, and archivists can all contribute together to make everything easier and more, more searchable and definitely bring about, as I was saying in the beginning, so I conclude new ways um, of writing history, starting with the primary sources. So I hope this was clear enough and if I managed to click on the last slide, <laughs> this was it on my set as well. Uh, we are both are available for any type of uh, questions or remarks or feedback at any time. Um, uh, but for now, I will stop sharing. So hopefully we can start a discussion with our attendees as, uh, as well. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Marta. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, just we, we have one question for you. Actually, I will combine it with my, with my question. This is from Chidam Bildirim, uh, uh, who is actually the head librarian of Amamet. So she asks that, uh, what, what kind of statistics can be taken from the portal related to the collections uh, which has been used? And my actually question is kind of a similar with that. Do you keep logs or statistical information about the uh, research keywords or the, the collections which are visited the most? This, this type of collections can we uh, get from the portal? So yeah, that's a very interesting question. Thank you. Um, so we have a statistics like, like any other web website at the moment from uh, Google Analytics. So we can track uh, you know, how many people use the portal, from where, uh, at what time, for how long, uh, what they search exactly. So we have, you know, the, the, the most sought after finding aids, uh, um, the, the most popular, the most popular documents from from which country, et cetera, or from which institution, uh, et cetera, et cetera, by week, month, day, year, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we don't really track too much about uh, who our users are, except from where they, they log in. It's a discussion that is ongoing, actually, how much we want to track them in, in the future, but that's really not for, um, for today as a, as a discussion, but we're, we're um, quite happy with, uh, we're quite happy with, with uh, usability. And at the moment, we don't track the type of keywords that are, um, that are used by users, uh, but this is something uh, that we will most likely do in the, in the new portal, um, exactly to understand, and which will help us also to improve um, the, 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 the search algorithm. So uh, yes, we will track in the future what, what type of keywords uh, people search, um, but we see it from the results for now. Another interesting thing we have is, uh, what how people arrive from on the portal from google and it's interesting that it's i think if you google archives portal europe it's only like 10 or 12 in in, in the list it's it's always somebody looking for some name of, of of place or body or a person that they're 
doing research on and then they find the archives portal Europe so I'm finding it so this is quite interesting because we see uh, lots of uh, you know like like you start with a name and then you arrive on archives portal Europe rather than starting the research on archives portal Europe which makes us um, quite happy because it means we're um, quite well placed on, on uh, we, we will provide quite a good uh, um, quite a good set of information um, to Google whenever whenever people are looking for for characters that may not be the most popular ones on, on Wikipedia or, um, or something like that. So this, this is really, really interesting, I think. And that is also something that we can provide at request. Oh, thank you. Uh, there's another question about the collaboration of uh, collaboration between the European and OPE. Maybe it's kind of related. Maybe one of you can uh, say more about the, the history of OPE and how the idea uh, shaped uh, in the past, uh, and also the collaboration within, uh, as I said, uh, up and Europeana is asked. Maybe you can say something on that as well. Kirsten, do you want to take this one? That's a <laughs> linking point between us and Europeana. <laughs> Yeah, so um, the, the history between European and Arcosport Europe actually started out when both projects uh, were initiated. So Europeana was kind of um, initiated a few months earlier than the Arcosport Europe. So they, they started in, in, in autumn 20, 2008, we started in early 2009. Uh, but Europeana was one of the partners in the APNET project. Um, specifically looking at this kind of connection between the archives domain and the cross domain approach um, that Europeana has um, and that essentially kind of has continued um, over the years. Um, in Apex they weren't a project partner anymore but essentially the funding scheme that we were under uh, in the context of the European Commission uh, connected us with Europeana. Um, and we are still uh, partnering in, in the current kind of Europeana projects that, that are ongoing. Um, essentially, one thing that we are always kind of um, emphasizing is that uh, while Europeana has very much a focus on digital objects, uh, we also look at everything that is not digitized yet or might never be digitized for different reasons. Um, so, so there always is kind of an, an additional value uh, in Archives Portal Europe for, for all of that. Uh, while, of course, Europeana is, is a bigger platform and, and kind of has, has, a, has a broader audience than, than Archives Portal Europe has. So it certainly also helps kind of accelerate your content if, if you're kind of represented in both portals, so to say. Oh, thank you. Marta, do you want to add something or I can move on to the next question? No, not really. It's just perhaps remark what, what Kirsten just said about the, the added value of, uh, um, of archival descriptions apart from accessing documents online, which is obviously the way we are used to think of the web, but really as a researcher um, having a place where to find out about archival collections we are having to contact institutions singularly um, perhaps in languages that I don't know it's uh, it, it was not the value and that was the idea behind um, behind creating the uh, Archives Portal Europe as a sort of like com companion to Europeana in a, in a in a way but focusing focusing really more as um, on on archival catalogs rather than rather than the objects of course when we promote digitization it's always better to have something ready available online but as Kirsten said it's simply undoable to think of digitize <laughs> everything and sometimes it's it's actually impossible so um but already knowing how to plan your archival trip is 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 a really big plus well, thank you actually this takes me to the uh, kind of a relevant question about the services that uh, the Apple portal offers to the users and also the institutions such as help with the research or the uh, grants. Uh, maybe you can a little bit uh, elaborate on these issues that what kind of other services that Apple provides uh, to the research body and also the institutions. And also related to with that, uh, 
that we are one of the institutions with uh, get a grant for the digitization and uh, thank you for that again and also uh, the second question will be are there specific uh, topics which have priority in terms of getting the up grant for digitization or what is the evaluation process of this uh, grant uh, application uh, yeah, so in, in terms of services, uh, what we already do and we hope to implement even further with, uh, um, with the portals for design is to help researchers in their, in their research, uh, whether it's actually helping out um, perhaps with a bit more skills as, as expert archivists uh, of researchers um, in, 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 in you know, how to find what, what we're trying to find or um, simply put them, putting them in touch directly with the, with the right archive when we're looking for something. This is done um, through the contact, in, sometimes, you know, through direct contact or through contact by institution. And then we sort of like mediate between researcher and um, an archivist, particularly through, through the, the country managers network. Um, and then uh, uh, about the grants, we have thought of um, just giving some, you know, some budget that we have every year um, to institutions that want to digitize uh, their collection, but focusing on the metadata, so on the digitization of the catalogs, uh, rather than uh, the digital objects only. Um, so we have two grants. Uh, one is specifically only about archival descriptions, either improving what's already on Archives Portal Europe, or um, creating new collections um, in, uh, in, in the standard formats with the view of ingesting in, in Archives Portal Europe. And the second one also involves the, um, the preparation of, uh, of digital images um, to then be ingested both in Archives Portal Europe and whenever possible in, in, in European. So the second one is done in collaboration with, uh, um, with Europeana. Uh, no, Kirsten, if you want to add something about the grants or <laughs> if there are other questions about it, we can get in more details, but otherwise we have just finished our 2022 call. Uh, so we will now be in, um, preparing the next one for uh, autumn 2023 and which will hopefully see also a few grants for uh, researchers um, to promote these transnational aspects of uh, of historical research but uh, we we mentioned we mentioned in the beginning uh, mustafa so i think you have your mic off we cannot hear you ah sorry so this talk is kind of an announcement for the other turkish institutions who are willing to apply the API grant so probably they will be interested uh, after this uh, talk and also this talk will be uh, will be broadcasted in uh, YouTube after uh, you know it is uh, finished. So there is another question, which is an interesting one. I think uh, Onur Yilmaz asks that if researchers want to cite a material, uh, how they can cite that when they find the material in APE. Uh, in APE. So does APE provide a citation or researchers have to go to the institution's website? So is there kind of a, uh, what's the, you know, copyright issues and also the citations of the different archival materials in the uh, portal? Uh, this, is, this is an excellent question. Thank you. No, at the moment, we don't have anything like um, citation download um, in any format. So it will depend a little bit on how the researcher uh, wants to um, wants to approach the citation. Of course, citation for um, for books or published material is always a bit more standardized than how you um, cite primary resources. Uh, however, if um, you can, of course, use the link of that specific finding aid if it's something you found on. Uh, um, on Archives Portal Europe. And then in my experience as a researcher, I, I always sort of like decided by myself how to construct the citation for, um, for an archive, quoting institution, uh, collection, <clears throat> and then down to the title of the document uh, whenever it was possible. But I've seen it in, in many different ways. And I think 
as long as it's something that allows other researchers uh, then to be able to go back and find the document as well, um, it's fine. Obviously, it's always better to ask the archivist. They will, they will be able to help you for their institution. Uh, the added value with the finding aid in Archives Portal Europe is that unless for some reason the URL changes, um, then from, from the finding aid, it's very easy to then understand where, where that specific document came from. So it's, um, it's, uh, uh, it's quite convenient to use it in, uh, um, in, citing, in, citing the, in citing the primary sources. But unfortunately, no, we, at the moment we don't have it. It could be a, a nice yeah. implementation for the future. So just something to take mental note of <laughs> for, for future for future yeah. um, for future use maybe i can just just add to that that uh, so in theory if if there is a preferred citation um, from the institution that could be part of the metadata um, so um, the the isa g for example um, has has a specific uh, element for that and so does does uh, our metadata standard um, so if if there's a requirement on on a certain structure of of cit citations um, that that can be included the other thing is that uh, we offer different uh, possibilities to essentially link back to the same item or the same items description in the original context so i mean even though as Marta mentioned, um, the, the the URLs in Archives Portal Europe are or can be considered relatively stable, um, and um, it it would always, of course, be more useful to to actually cite the the original data provider site um, and and the information there. So that's why we are offering different possibilities to link back to to the content providers. Thank you very much. There is that one question about the data preparation tool. Uh, again, Shidam Bildrum asks that is that a separate program in the central system? Can you person probably this is this question is for you. Yes, uh, I, I received just before the end of your uh, presentation, but I, I think I missed it. So now I'm just uh, directing to you. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, so, so the data preparation tool is not part of the central system. It's a completely independent tool that you can download and use locally. I'm going to post the, the link to the latest release in, in the chat. Uh, so it's available on our GitHub page. Um, it essentially offers the same functionalities as the Archives Portal Europe dashboard would. So you can validate your files, you can convert your files, um, you can use either the default transformation scripts that come with the tool uh, and which are the same as we use in the central system, or you can also use your own transformation scripts um, if, if you have any, um, and you can essentially kind of use that to prepare your data uh, in order to then ingest it into, in the, into the portal. So a lot of our content providers use the data preparation tool, for example, at the very beginning. So when they are trying out their data and then are not quite sure yet if everything kind of ends up in the, in the right place, so to say, in the transformation. Um, but some are also using it uh, just kind of to um, yeah, lessen the constraint on, on internet connection for example. So preparing your data, having it completely ready, and then only kind of doing the upload into Archives Portal Europe at the very end. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you both of you. I think we have come to the end of questions. There are no questions left to be asked. So just if you have any additional comments to, or you just, uh, you know, Add anything to the or just say to the Turkish institutions or Turkish uh, researchers, uh, then we can uh, pass the floor to uh, Natalie to the closing uh, remarks. Um, well, perhaps just uh, final, <laughs> final lot to say to please get in touch whether your institutions uh, interested in becoming content provider. Uh, I'm sure Kesti mentioned it, but uh, as content providers, all the services we offer, offer are absolutely for, for free. Um, so it's just a matter of putting a little bit of work uh, on your side if you're in the in the capacity of uh, of doing that. And it's uh, you know we we. we it's always great to always have new institutions on board. 
Um, and similarly, if you are researchers struggling or interested in, in using the portal, uh, again, do get in touch for some extra tips on how, how to operate the portal and do your research. Then thank you very much otherwise. <laughs> Thank you very much to all. That was very, very informative. And we believe that um, and we hope that uh, more institutions will uh, will join this portal because it's really crucial for, for the institutions to be um, more present in those portals. Uh, every institution try their best uh, to, um, to provide their collections to a larger audience, but those portals are really crucial in doing that. So thank you for establishing such a portal in the first place. Um, and at this point, um, um, I would like to thank to the audience for, for their questions as well. And I would like to inform them that uh, Animat Library Talks will continue next month uh, with a talk about another archive, uh, which is called Koch University Medical and Health Humanities Initiative talk given by Lucien Dice Shanojak from Koch University. And thank you very much, dear Marta and dear Kirsten and dear Mustafa uh, for this wonderful talk. And uh, hopefully um, see you at another time, maybe in Istanbul. <laughs> and uh, thank, thank you. you. Yes. Goodbye. <laughs> would be great. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.